Welcome everybody to Crow Canyon's weekly webinar. Today we're very excited to have Merritt Munson here talking about color in the ancestral Pueblo Southwest. I will introduce her in a minute, but first we'll go through some of the uh, logistics here. Well done. Hopefully everyone can see my screen. Um, Okay, so I want to begin by thanking all the people who are making this possible, and especially here at Crow Canyon, Dylan Schwint and Taylor Hasbrook are the masterminds who make this all happen behind the scenes. Uh, I also want to acknowledge some of our funders. Uh, funding for this has been provided by Colorado Humanities and by the National Endowment for the Humanities as part of the Coronavirus Aid, Relief, and Economic Security Act. Uh, economic Stabilization Plan of 2020. I think probably at this point, most people are pretty familiar with Zoom, but uh, here are just some of the things you can do. So our heads are floating in a window somewhere on your screen at this point, and you can move those, just click on it and move us out of the way um, if we're getting in the way of reading the slides. Um, if you have any questions, can you put them please in the Q&A? Um, section that is, is on your screen. Uh, we will try to get to all your questions. Lately, we've had a lot of questions, so uh, we'll do our best with that. Um, if you're having any trouble with the Zoom um, streaming, you can always head over to our live stream on Facebook at our Crow Canyon Archaeological Center page. And also, our, our um, webinars go up on YouTube, usually a day or two after, after they uh, stream. And so there is our YouTube um, channel crowcanyon.org slash YouTube um, and we would love for you to subscribe to us on there. I should have introduced myself. My name is Michelle Turner. I'm an archaeologist who works here at Crow Canyon and I'm just going to be moderating for Merit today. Okay, Crow Canyon, for those of you who aren't familiar with it, wanted to share our mission, which is to empower present, present and future generations by making the human past accessible and relevant through archaeological research, experiential education, and American Indian knowledge. Um, and certainly this webinar series has been a big part of that lately. Uh, and there's our website if you want to know more about us, crowcanyon.org. We have upcoming webinars. Um, next week, we're gonna have Dr. Ricky Lightfoot uh, talking about uh, Crow Canyon Archaeological Center history in the making. Uh, same time, same place next week. And then the week after we have a talk on uh, Casas Grandes. Samantha Baumkamp is giving a talk titled Studying Casas Grandes Ceramics from the Midwest to Chihuahua, Mexico. So exciting things to look forward to. And of course, all of you know that the COVID situation has really hit uh, Native American communities really hard this year. And um, we've been including this slide that gives you some suggestions of places where you can donate to make a difference. Um, I'm not gonna read through the whole thing, but I believe that this will be emailed out to people who registered. And um, let's see, we've got the Pueblo Relief Fund, the official Navajo Nation COVID Relief Fund, the Hopi Relief Fund, the Navajo and Hopi Families COVID Relief Fund, and the Bluff Area Mutual Aid Fund. And there are email addresses for those. All right, so I'm very pleased to introduce Dr. Merritt Munson, who will be giving our talk today on color in the ancestral Pueblo Southwest. Uh, this is her specialty, and it's very exciting to have her here today. Uh, Dr. Munson is a professor at Trent University. Uh, I just learned that she was formerly a field intern here at Crow Canyon, so she too is coming, coming full circle and <laughs> rejoining us. Um, she wrote a book, a wonderful book, called The Archaeology of Art in the American Southwest, and she is the co-editor of a brand new book that just came out, this beautiful book that she co-edited with Kelly Hayes Gilpin, which is also titled Color in the Ancestral Pueblo Southwest. So we are very happy to have you here, Merritt. I'm going to turn it over to you, and people, if people want to ask questions, just put it in that Q&A box, and we'll get to it at the end, I think. Um, all right, I will turn it over to you and stop sharing. All right. Great. Thank you so much, Michelle. And thank you to Taylor and to everyone else at Crow Canyon for helping to organize this and for asking me to come today. Um, I'll get my screen up here in just a minute. Um, but I just wanted to, to say uh, thanks to Crow Canyon 
for sponsoring these talks and for um, for asking me to come and join you. Um, color is a subject that I've been working on for quite a long time. So let's see, Michelle, you're seeing my screen okay? Okay. Um, and color is a subject that I've been interested in for a long time. Um, and I'm intrigued to realize that it's kind of a subject that's everywhere these days, or at least that's what it seems like to me. So if you're digitally inclined, you can download apps for your phone that will create a decorative palette for you out of your favorite photo. Um, you can go to a hardware store and get them to color match paint to almost anything you can think of. Uh, there's even a color of the year, uh, which is announced annually by the Pantone Color Institute. Um, it's I believe classic blue this year. Anyway, color is an important uh, aspect of our society at this time. Um, the strange thing about color though is that when we think about it, it's very uncommon for us to consider color in the past. I think most of us actually tend to think about the past as being in earth tones. And we owe some of that probably to the um, photos that we know of uh, that illustrate um, archaeological excavations in the past because they're mostly in grayscale. And so we have photos like our friend's friend here, Dr. Fuchs, who was uh, working at Mesa Verde when this photo was taken. And the past is very much illustrated in black and white. Um, there's actually, in addition to this sort of uh, bias or sense that um, the past was was black and white. We also have a bias against color in Western thought. And this has been prevalent for a very long time. Um, color is considered to be superficial or frivolous. It's not a serious subject. And some people would say, well, surely archaeologists have something more important to talk about, don't we? To which I would say nonsense, because of course the past was full of color. And these are colors that were chosen with purpose and often with great effort. Colors that were used to convey information and evoke emotions, colors used to carry complex meanings and to make things beautiful. In reality, the past was more like this. Now, this photo is just stunning. Uh, it was created by uh, Chris Downham at the Northern Arizona University with the help of Ryan Belknap and Daniel Boone. And this is a photo that, um, Chris set up a while ago, and he talks about how he wanted to use modern materials to recreate the kinds of colors and colorful materials that we know were used in the past. And one of the reasons why he wanted to do this was because he talked, uh, when I wrote to ask him if I could use this photo today, he talked about how when we think of color in the past, if we do, we tend to think of these sort of tattered and sort of dull uh, bits of color. So the pieces like this that are in the in the Smithsonian's collections, where the color is present, but it's a bit dull and it's not particularly impressive. Well, when you look at an array of modern materials, these are so striking and so beautiful, and it gives us a real sense of how moving and important color might have been in the past. This, in all of its glory, this is what color was and could be. So I've long had a uh, sense that color was important in the past because I'm an archeologist who's interested in art. So I've recorded rock paintings and I've hiked into the back country to visit sites with colorful murals. Um, I've worked in a lot of museum collections with painted pottery and with grinding stones stained with pigment. But when I started thinking about color more seriously in archaeology, I realized that we archaeologists have not typically done a very good job of recording color. What you usually see in archaeological reports are statements like this. So when Fuchs was working at Mesa Verde in the early 1900s, he wrote about finding grinding slabs at Spruce Tree House that were, quote, found to be covered with pigments of various colors. So it's useful to know that he found these items, but we have no indication whatsoever of what the colors were. Um, a similar case happened uh, about a half century later when Neil Judd was working at Chaco Canyon, and he wrote about working at the great house of Pueblo del Arroyo, 
saying that he found, quote, only one piece of red paint worth cataloging. Presumably that's this piece here in the slide because this is a piece from Pueblo del Arroyo um, that's in the collections of, of the Natch, Nat, sorry, in the collections of the National Museum of Natural History in Washington, D.C. But if he only found one piece worth cataloging, what other pieces did he find and not bother with? So when I started to look at color in the past, I mostly realized that we didn't really have any good systematic sense of how ancestral Pueblo people used color at all. So I realized that the best way to address this was going to be to draw on the knowledge of my colleagues, because looking at color in a um, uh, widespread or complete way across time and space was going to require people with knowledge in lots of different areas. And so I turned to my colleagues, uh, Kelly Hayes Gilpin, Polly Shaftsma, Jill Neitzel, and David Witt to contribute to um, this book project which uh, is titled Color in the Ancestral Pueblo Southwest and is published by the University of Utah Press. And so working together, we were able to write a book that gave a comprehensive picture of how ancestral Pueblo people used color in the past and what choices they made across time and space. When we started this project, though, I realized quite quickly that we needed to understand how color worked in the past, that is, how did color work before we had our super customized chemically colored world? What does it mean, for example, when you need to create colors from nature rather than synthesizing them in a lab? And what I found was really um, startling and really quite fun, I thought. Um, take a rainbow, for example. So most of us were taught in maybe elementary school primary school, most of us were taught that a rainbow has seven colors, and they are in order from red through violet, and that the way to memorize the order of the colors is to use the mnemonic Roy G. Biv. But did you know that in ancient Rome, writers couldn't decide how many colors there were in the rainbow? Some authors said there were three, some said there were six. And then the part that's even more surprising to me is that people couldn't decide what order those colors came in. In medieval Europe, the big question of the day for religious authorities was about the essential nature of color. And the big argument was, was color a manifestation of divine light or was it a worldly distraction created by the devil? Science didn't really make a solid contribution to color thinking until the 1660s when Isaac Newton was able to demonstrate that color consisted of different wavelengths of visible light. And even then it took another century before the idea of organizing the spectrum, ordering the spectrum by wavelength began to take hold. Now, Newton's was far from the last attempt to organize color. Um, at last count, people have come up with something like 165 different systems for ordering color. They're covered in, uh, I was going to say excruciating detail, um, in Cooney and Schwartz's book, Color Ordered. Uh, it's, a, it's a highly detailed account of all of these different attempts to organize color. And the reason why there are so many different attempts to organize color is because each system represents people trying to capture some aspects of what humans experience as color vision. And it turns out that capturing that experience of color is far more complicated than you would imagine at first glance. Now, for archaeologists, color systems are mostly familiar through the Munsell system. So the Munsell color system was developed by an art educator named Munsell in the early 20th century. And he created a three-dimensional conceptual space represented by the image on the right-hand side of the screen here. And his concept organized color by three different sort of variables or characteristics, and those were hue, value, and chroma. And you can see how they um, correspond to the sort of equator of the sphere, the um, diameter, or the vertical axis. Now, the Munsell system is uh, really helpful when communicating with other archaeologists. 
archaeologists around the world use the Munsell soil color chart, which looks like what you see here on the screen. It's a book full of highly controlled, very um, uh, precisely reproduced color chips that allow you to communicate with other archaeologists. So at one point in time, archaeologists talking about color would use terms like bice, B-I-C-E, or sulfurino, or mummy, or other colors like that, which are not really intelligible anymore. So instead of those kinds of color names, archaeologists now can use uh, names like 7.5YR5-6, which is gibberish to most folks. But I promise you that archaeologists in the audience are nodding happily and saying, yes, mm -hmm, that's a really nice brown. Um, in the Munsell system, that is referred to, in fact, as a strong brown. That's the color name given to it. But as long as you have a chart of your own, the Munsell system is really useful in standardizing color recording because anyone with the chart is able to look up the color. There's a downside to this convenience, though, and that is that the Munsell chart reinforces the idea that color is universal. In other words, that everyone thinks and speaks about color in the same way and that they always have done. Now, in reality, co color language and color thinking are considerably more complex than that, and I would say far more interesting as well. The Zuni language is an excellent example of this complexity. Zuni color words encompass two radically different ways of thinking about color. The first is static color. So color that is unchanging, very similar to what a Munsell color chip represents. The second way of thinking about color in Zuni is verb based with color terms that focus on the likelihood that a particular substance will change in color. And that change might happen through processes like ripening or aging or fading over time. So this means that two objects that appear to be exactly the same hue, value, and chroma on the Munsell chart, that is, they look like the same square or the same color chip, these two objects may conceptually be completely different to Zuni folks because maybe one is inherently yellow while the other one has changed to yellow or is in the process of changing to a yellowish color through a ripening process. So the Zuni case, along with other examples, is a good reminder of how important it is to ground our research in context-specific information about how historic and contemporary Pueblo people think and speak about colors. In many Pueblos, for example, all of these turquoise pendants on the screen here might all be considered variations on the same color, a blue-green. Uh, there's no, not necessarily any linguistic difference between blue and green. Linguists call this color gru, G-R-U, which is awkward, but captures that same sense that green and blue sort of meld seamlessly into each other and are simply variations on a single color. Now, when we uh, speak to Pueblo artists today or look to the ethnographic literature, we also know that color is meaningful for Pueblo folks for a wide range of practical and religious reasons. So as with all North American indigenous groups, colors have strong directional symbolism in Pueblo thought. Color choices may also reflect a religious principle of light producing light. So for example, wet white clay might summon rain from clouds, or yellow might evoke pollen and therefore fertility. Pueblo people may also combine colors to draw on multiple references, creating complex nuanced meanings. And then finally, the historic and ethnographic records make it very clear that dyes and pigments and paints are technologies. Some of them are fairly straightforward, but others require considerable work and knowledge to use successfully. There are recipes and procedures for making these paints and using these pigments. So a lot of the work that uh, I drew on in particular in the color book 
was based on um, museum collections and the existing literature. And I think that's one of the important lessons that uh, all of us involved in this project learned about working with um, a, a topic like color. And that is that museum collections and existing publications are really important or should be really important to archeological research in part because that's making, uh, using existing records is, it's good stewardship. It's making use of information that has already been collected from the archeological record. And it's also the best strategy to use when researching relatively rare or unusual items. We can only see the broader patterns in how people use different tools or materials or processes if we draw together many different sources of information. And in the case of our book, uh, multiple authors, each with different specialties. Okay, so with that as sort of a, a preliminary um, framework for the book, what is it that we've learned about color in the past? So our research, our research shows that color choices varied widely across the ancestral Pueblo world. Rather than following a linear trajectory from simple to complex, as people often think was the case, the use of color ebbed and flowed over time with different individuals and communities using color and relating to colorful materials in diverse ways. During the basket maker period, so from around 1000 or 500 BC to about 8700, the earliest farmers made use of a varied palette of locally available materials. Basket maker rock paintings typically used clay-based colors that created a diverse palette of soft and muted colors, as in the case of these images in this very extensive large-scale uh, pictograph panel in Canyonlands National Park, which is known as the Great Gallery. Um, most other media were, uh, sorry, I got out of order there. Um, most other media were fairly basic in color, um, with dark and sometimes red on a natural background, and that held true for um, the earliest decorated pottery, for baskets, textiles, and painted wood as well. Um, it appears though that when basket makers had a choice, they preferred to use polychrome, but they didn't necessarily privilege any particular color or material over another. Through most of the Pueblo I to Pueblo III time periods, most people chose simpler bichrome or two-color combinations. Um, and I will note that when I say Pueblo I to Pueblo III, I'm covering a fairly um, broad or uh, a fairly broad, fairly significant chunk of time here from about 8700 to 1300. I'll, I'll uh, talk about some more specific narrower bits of time within this broader range um, as I move through my talk. But in general, from Pueblo I to Pueblo III, people chose relatively simple bi bichrome combinations. So one example would be um, white clay painting like you see here on the screen on a plain stone background. Or in the Pueblo III period in Mesa Verde, people uh, sometimes used red paint on a white or tan plastered wall as you see in these images uh, on the screen. Pottery uh, from P1 to P3 was usually um, black paint on a white slip or black on a red slip when it was decorated. But even within these relatively simple bichrome or two color color schemes, specific combinations might be associated with particular contexts or uses. So for example, in the Pueblo III period, the pottery of the Cayenta tradition um, we see a pattern where most jars were black paint on a white background, as you see in this image, whereas most bowls tended to be black paint on a red background. So black on white jars, black on red bowls, the combination of form and color seems to have been important in the choices that people were making in decorating their pottery. Now, I mentioned a minute ago that um, these bichrome combinations were typical of the Pueblo I to Pueblo III time periods, but there are two major exceptions to this bichrome rule. 
The first is that there was extensive use of polychrome or multiple colors in elite contexts at Chaco Canyon and in the Sanawa area. So Chaco Canyon is probably familiar to most of you. Um, it's a, a very famous, very well-known part of the Southwest, um, a world heritage site. And archeologists working at Chaco have encountered many different examples of bright and colorful materials at great houses or large sites like Pueblo Benito. Um, there are thousands of pieces of turquoise that have come from Chaco Canyon used in necklaces and earrings and other kinds of ornaments. There are also uh, pieces like you see on the screen here. So in the left-hand image, there's an illustration of a couple of pieces of jet, uh, which is a kind of black stone um, in the shape of a frog and also of a square. And each of these uh, jet pieces is inlaid with turquoise as well. Um, then you see two different images uh, both the illustration on the left and a photo on the right of a scraper that's made out of a piece of animal bone that has turquoise and jet inlay on the handle to make a geometric pattern. Um, and then the item on the right-hand side in the photo, that tall cylinder, is a cylindrical basket-shaped kind of tube, and it's covered with a mosaic made of pieces of turquoise that have been adhered to the surface of the basket. So these items are unusual and extremely highly decorated, and they're making very heavy use in this particular case of turquoise and of jet. Um, there are also examples in Chaco Canyon of items from great houses that uh, show some really bright and striking use of polychrome painting. The pieces that you see here on the screen are pieces of wooden paraphernalia of some sort. There's different ideas about what these might have been used for. But these are wooden items that have been painted in uh, multiple different colors and presumably were um, ritual paraphernalia. They were found all kind of um, uh, essentially crushed together in a single room in Chetro Kettle, one of the Chocolin Great Houses in Chaco Canyon. Um, some of these pieces clearly represent uh, bird heads and probably feathers. Uh, some of them may represent flowers, like the pieces on the left. Um, we certainly know that Chacoins used feathers of macaws, which came from Mexico and were traded up into the Chacoin world in northern New Mexico. Um, and Chacoins used feathers of macaws as well as other birds, both local and exotic. So color in the Chacoan world seems as if it's centered on visually striking materials. And these were often material, materials that were obtained from a great distance or from specific locations in the broader landscape used under the supervision of specialized religious leaders and elites. A similar pattern, this idea of bright, polychrome colors being used by um, elites and religious leaders, similar pattern appears to have extended beyond the height of the Chacoan era into sites of the Sanawa region in uh, Arizona. And the kinds of objects that we find in Arizona are actually fairly similar in some ways to those found um, in the Chacoan world. Uh, these include raw pigments, prepared paints, and then a lot of very elaborately painted items like wood, uh, pieces of wood and bone and shell materials. The object on the left in the, in the slide here is a really unusual piece. It's a clay coated painted basket. And um, that's exactly what it sounds like. It seems counterintuitive, but it's a basket that was covered in wet clay, which was smoothed down and polished and then the clay was painted in very bright polychrome designs. The images on the screen are all renderings of objects found, um, recovered by archeologists that were painted by Virgil Hubert uh, of the Museum of Northern Arizona. The basket um, itself was actually painted this kind of greenish hue on the inside and then blue, uh, two different shades of blue, um, 
red and yellow on the outside in this very complicated fret-like pattern. So these are unusual specialized items. And the distribution of these kinds of items suggests that some individuals in Sanawa society held positions of religious or ceremonial leadership, and that these positions were facilitated in part through the use of color. So elite contexts were polychrome, even when most of the rest of the Pueblo II and Pueblo III world was bichrome. There's also one other exception to the bichrome rule of Pueblo I through Pueblo III, and that has to do with pottery. So by about 1125 or 1150 or so, potters in the Western Pueblo area began experimenting with new color combinations uh, using more than one color on a slipped background to create polychrome pottery. Um, the ones that you see here on the screen are all examples of a kind of ceramic called Tusian polychrome, and you've got a red and black paint on an orange background. Um, throughout the 1200s and into the 1300s, these colorful new polychrome traditions expanded in range and variety throughout the ancestral Pueblo world. The use of polychrome by ritual specialists in P2 and P3 foreshadowed the fluorescence of color in the Pueblo IV period. Pueblo IV, which uh, lasts from uh, around 1300 or so until 1540 or 1600, depending on where you place um, the, the end dates of that period. Pueblo IV is a time when polychrome was virtually everywhere. Um, in Kiva mural paintings, like this image from Pottery Mound, uh, just to the south of Albuquerque, uh, rock art also became more colorful. And although petroglyphs or rock carvings remain the most common kind of rock art, there's some indication that pictographs or painted images were increasingly important in the Pueblo IV period. Potters also drew on a wide range of colors, uh, building on the polychrome experiments of the late Pueblo III period. Uh, Pueblo IV potters drew on a wide range of colors and they experimented with a lot of new techniques. In the Hopi area, for example, which is where these ceramics on the screen are from, um, potters added visual texture. So in addition to using polychrome color combinations, they also used these techniques that added visual texture to their work. These included things like dry brushing, um, spatter painting by spraying or spattering paint onto a surface, um, and incising on some pottery. A similar sense of experimentation with color and texture shows up in rock art and Kiva murals from Pueblo IV, where painters used color to add fine details. Uh, sometimes they added outlines to delineate shapes and they built up layers of paint that accumulated over time, creating these sort of palimpsests where one layer builds upon the previous one. What's really interesting about the Pueblo IV period is that even as polychromes flourished in all of these different media, ancestral Pueblo people still maintained a very purposeful opposition between black and white pottery and textiles compared to black on red or polychrome counterparts. So this mural that you see on the screen, this is a rendering of a mural from Pottery Mound in New Mexico. This mural shows um, textiles, presumably hanging on a wall. And these textiles are alternating between painted polychrome blankets and dyed black and white blankets. So if you look to the far left of the image, you see um, a panel that has diagonal red or reddish stripes, as well as some black and white on a diagonal. That would be a textile that was painted on the surface to create that design. The next textile over, the next block, second from the left, is black and white. And the characteristic pattern that you see there, this dot in square motif, as it's called, is very typical of tie-dye traditions. Those tie-dye traditions are typically associated with the South, 
whereas the painted polychrome textiles are more typical of the northern southwest. And there's a lot of different ideas about what this juxtaposition of colors means, this kind of pairing of polychrome on the one hand with black and white on the other. But it seems likely that this image reflects different social groups. That might be people with different migration histories, such as people coming together from two different villages or locations at Pottery Mound and bringing their textile traditions with them. Or it might reflect groups within a village who have different textile traditions and different religious responsibilities. But there definitely seems to be a kind of a complementarity here between polychrome and black and white. One thing that's also very clear in the Pueblo IV period is that many of the aspects of color that we know about from the ethnographic literature and from speaking to uh, contemporary Pueblo people, many aspects of color seem to have fallen into place during the Pueblo IV period, perhaps as early as about AD 1300, when Pueblo ancestors began to develop new ritual practices and transform their ways, uh, sorry, transform their world in ways that were both colorful and very profound. So turning now from the histories of color choices over time and space, I want to consider what we've learned about studying color in the past. I mentioned earlier that archeologists have a poor track record with color. And we certainly need to do a better job recognizing colorful materials and documenting them. It's sometimes difficult to decide whether or not what you're seeing is color that was intentionally applied or color that just happens to be present. So the color, the red on these uh, bowl shirts, for example, is this red from paint that was mixed or stored in this bowl, or is it a stain that happened after the fact? We need to be able to recognize which uh, case we're looking at, and then to document the colors. Now, at a minimum, that means that we ought to be using the Munsell chart diligently and trying to capture variation in color. But capturing variation is much more challenging than it sounds. So when you look at these items on the screen, how would you record these colors? You can identify a color chip on a chart, but that's not very meaningful when you look at the variation within these items and also when you think about which color is most important or which would have been most important. So for example, the copper bell that's in the middle of the screen here, this particular bell is actually from Mexico, um, not from the Southwest. But I put it in here because it's one of the only bell pictures I have of a bell in collections that's been cleaned up somewhat so that you can see the kind of metallic sheen of the copper. So we know that when the bell was in use, or when copper is new, that it's shining and bright with that warm coppery color. We know that it darkens over time, and we also know that copper tends to get this green cast to it, which is the verdigris that forms as copper weathers. So which color do we record? Well, it's complicated. And it's rather ironic, really, because in the process of writing a book about color, I've come to realize just how inadequate my concept of color actually is. We can focus on basic hues like red and black and yellow and white, and we can try to force everything into simple categories. But this limited understanding of colors is really problematic, and that's true for several different reasons. The first reason is that the research clearly shows that materials may be important not only for their color, but also because of their geographic place of origin and their associations with known places in the landscape. There's a location in the Grand Canyon, for example, not visible in this particular shot, but there's a location in the Grand Canyon that's famous for its brilliant red pigment. And that's a pigment that's been traded among tribes since time immemorial. The lasting importance of such pigments is at least in part due to the fact that they are literally pieces of significant places. Pigments and paints, in part because of where they come from and who and what they're associated with, pigments and paints are animate 
they're animated substances. They have agency in this world and in spiritual realms. They make things happen. Now, the ideas of animacy and agency might sound a bit abstract, but I'll ask you to think back to this photo that I showed you early in the talk. Even when it's reduced to a small rectangle on my screen, this picture has real presence to it. And Chris Downham has talked about what it was like to lay out these materials, what a presence they had, and to, to see them in person and how striking it was to be near these materials. And that's speaking of someone in the modern world where color's constantly and endlessly available. So imagine what the impact of these materials would be, what they would have meant in an era when each item might represent thousands of kilometers of travel or significant carefully cultivated trading relationships or years of training and preparation needed to handle and collect them safely. The power of landscape and of presence means that colors that look the same visually may in fact be completely different materials and each may be used in a manner appropriate to its own properties, its particular origins and its efficacy. At the Pueblo Four site of Hamalavi, for example, uh, a researcher named Myers, has, uh, Julia Myers, has found that pigments and paints that look like the same hue, that is, they appear to be red. They look the same, but they were used in quite different ways. And that is because different reds have different properties and powers. Not all red is equal. In addition, we know that hue isn't necessarily stable. So some colors are inherent and relatively permanent, like the red of hematite and other iron oxide um, based pigments, like some of the ones you see here on the screen. The black color of jet is also quite stable. But remember that many other colors have the capacity to transform or ripen or fade. And when I use those terms, you should be thinking back to that example of Zuni verb based color language, where changes and transformations are important. Some years ago, I was working in the collections of the National Museum of Natural History at the Smithsonian, and I was puzzled by the number of paint pots that had been collected from Zuni in the late uh, 19th century that were double paint pots, like the one you see here, one half for black pigment and the other half for yellow. And at the time, I kept thinking, why black and yellow? Why black and yellow? I don't, I don't, I can't think of a good, what's the association between black and yellow? And it took a while because I just needed to think differently. The yellow was only yellow in the paint pot. The yellow is a mineral-based pigment that fires to red in the heat of the fire. So although the paint pots are black and yellow, the paint that they produce is in fact after firing black and red, like the vessel that you see on the right hand side of the screen. And interestingly, we've even found evidence of this kind of thing in the past as well. So what you see here on the screen are on the left hand side, some unfired sherds of pottery, which is amazing that they preserved. These are sherds that are of a style we would refer to as TCN polychrome before firing. When they're fired, the colors change dramatically and you end up with color combinations more like the fired bowl that you see on the right. So these kinds of color changes, these transformations are striking. And we know from modern potters at Hopi that Pueblo folks often think of these changes as being important, as being in uh, the words of one Hopi potter is being a blush of the pot that shows when the pot has become animate or when it has come to life. A similar process can happen when flint nappers heat chert in a fire before working it, which changes its working properties and also its color. Even turquoise changes color through its life history in response to being worn or handled or exposed to sunlight. 
So we need to think about the ways that color can transform. But beyond hue, we need to consider other visual properties as well. Copper bells like the ones I showed you earlier likely got some of their meaning from their metallic shine, which reflected the warmth of lands to the south where flowers grow and bloom and where in fact the copper in the southwest mostly derived from. The iridescence of things like hummingbird feathers and haliotis shell, like the pieces on this necklace on the slide, draw attention in similar ways. They catch the eye. The same is true of sparkling or glittering minerals, such as micaceous clays or specular hematite, which is a form of hematite that is glistening and metallic looking. Although not usually considered color in their own right, these visual properties of iridescence and glittering and sparkling and shine may be important qualities in addition to, or even instead of color. And finally, when we're thinking of color, I need to address the issue of meaning. Everyone always wants to know, but what do these colors mean? And I'll have to admit that this is in many ways my least favorite question about color. So, we know that ancestral Pueblo people chose color thoughtfully and with purpose, but we shouldn't expect color symbolism to be simple. There's no color code to be broken. There's no stable universal meanings for specific colors. There's no formula that says red equals blood or black equals death or white equals purity. You look at cultures around the world and realize that those basic concepts, those basic formulas break down. They don't apply in every location. In the Pueblo Southwest, we can draw on historic and contemporary information to suggest potential meanings. So for example, that white clay handprints on cliff faces might be prayers for rain. The wet white clay bringing the clouds, the white clouds heavy with rain or that a line of black terraced designs, like you see on the kiva jar in the upper left of this image, that these black terrace designs might represent dark storm clouds, also heavy with rain. Above all though, we know that color symbolism is flexible and multifaceted. It's sensitive to context, it's full of poetic nuance. Color is after all, both material and sublime. It's an active participant in daily life and ritual performance, and it's persistent evidence of cultural change and of continuity. Imagine how much richer our view of the past can be when, when we make room to appreciate that color in the Pueblo world was, and still is, as much about animacy and place and process as it is about hue. Thank you. I'm happy to take your questions. Thank you so much, Merritt. All right, we have a bunch of questions that are, are technological about how different paints were made. Oh, yeah. um, so one person asked about the wooden objects at Chaco. How did they make the purple? Mm. I'm gonna go back to that slide. Um, let's see, I have to make sure I'm still sharing my screen though, which I'm not, just one moment. So the slide in question, um, ah, okay, it didn't like that. Hang on, I'm gonna go back. Let me just find what I need and then I will put the screen back on. Um, the color in question, purple is an interesting question in and of itself. So first I'll answer your question about how they made some of the colors and then I will talk about purple. So I'm gonna try sharing again. Can you see? Yes. Yes, okay. So um, the, sh the short answer, okay. Short answer about colors and painting wood in particular is that many of these colors are probably pretty straightforward. So um, a lot of them would be based on either um, naturally colored clays or minerals that have been ground up very fine. And usually those colors would 
be applied by mixing them with a little bit of water and sometimes mixing them with something to use as a binder that helps to fix it in place. And that can include um, fats. So for example, chewing sunflower seeds and spitting those into the paint or using potentially animal fats or those kinds of materials. So that takes care of things like red and white, some of the black paint and so on. The really tricky color is the green blue because if you take turquoise and you grind it down, the turquoise actually essentially loses its color. The finer it's ground, the paler the color gets and it becomes very unsatisfying as a pigment. The green in this painted wood is likely a kind of a resin based paint. I don't know this for sure yet. We need some we need to have some testing to know for sure. But there's a recipe of for paint used at Hopi in the 1890s that um, is called copper resonate in the art history world. And it's um it's basically pine pitch and ground copper bearing minerals that are combined in a really complicated process that makes a very resinous paint. And that gives you this uh, green that's very intense um, and bright. So the colors here range from relatively easy to apply to extremely complicated. The recipe for this green takes a lot of knowledge to produce properly. Now in terms of a purple, purple is a bit of a sleeper because it's not a color that's often seen in the past. That's probably because color uh, purple is a difficult color to make um, chemically. And I would say that the I'm just looking at all the different pieces of wood here. The pieces that seem to have a purplish hue are probably mostly reds that have faded. So, for example, there's a flower in the uh, left hand image that's got a bit of a reddish color, reddish purple around the edge. I think that's red that's darkened considerably. Um, the center photo also, there's a kind of a bird tail at the bottom of that one. And that I think is black with white rather than the purple with white. So purple is not well known in the past. Um, and I think here we're mostly looking at, if it looks purple on your screen, it's probably mostly effects of time and also some differences in screen okay. adjustments. And sort of a related question, I think this was about the next slide with the Sinagua object. Mm -hmm. Somebody asked about the blue. Mm. So the blue, um, blues also, so blue and green, these are the two trickiest colors to get reliably. They're also the hardest to procure the raw materials for. Blue and green both come from copper-based pigments, essentially from azurite, which is a blue copper-based mineral and malachite, which is a green copper-based mineral. And actually the Sanawa area um, is an area where those materials occur naturally. So um, they're relatively available in that region of the Southwest compared to other places, although people in all areas use them. So essentially you're talking about a, a malachite or an azurite ground up fine and applied, usually with a binder to help hold it in place. Okay, another question we had about colors. Um, somebody asked about the Zuni paint pot and what the yellow mineral was that, that they would have been using that I guess changed into red. Yep, so the yellow mineral, um, pardon my scrolling, um, I just need to get down here. The yellow mineral is probably limonite and limonite is a uh, sort of technical name for what we would tend to call yellow ochre. Um, so it's a, it's an iron based mineral and it's because there's iron in that yellow that when it fires, it turns red. So the yellow itself is, um, the, the pigment contains iron that is not oxidized. And when I say oxidized, I'm talking about the same kind of process that happens when something rusts. So if you have an iron nail, um, and you leave it out exposed to uh, time and weather, it rusts and becomes a reddish rusty color. This is essentially the same process with yellow paints. When they're fired, if they're fired in the presence of a lot of oxygen, 
then the iron in the paint oxidizes. Same kind of chemical reaction as rusting, um, but it happens in the heat of the fire and it turns that iron in the paint into this red form. Okay. Um, another question. Have you ever come across the use of uranium bearing minerals as pigments? And the question is coming from someone who lives near Canyon de Chez and has seen those minerals lying around. I haven't. Um, it's not something I know anything about. Um, one of the difficulties in studying pigments um, archaeologically is that uh, for the most part, when archaeologists make note of pigments, we talk about their color. And you'll notice that I was doing the same thing here. So often we don't have a great sense of the specific chemical makeup of any particular pigment, um, which is an interesting, it's an interesting kind of quandary. It's an interesting dilemma to have because on the one hand, knowing the really fine details about exact composition of paints can be really useful in figuring out the sources of materials and different recipes and so on. But the reality is that the way that a geochemist, for example, or a mineralogist might classify a pigment is unlikely to be the same at all as uh, people in the past or in the present would categorize that paint. So uh, uranium, I'm not sure about, but I was thinking back to this question about the yellow paint here. Mm -hmm. You know, a geologist might call that limonite. Someone else would call it yellow ochre. And it might just be a clay that has some staining of unoxidized iron that's not quite limonite, but is something related to it. And so we need to think a little bit about the difference between how, uh, how different scientists would categorize minerals and how people using them would categorize them. Yeah. And on the other end of the spectrum, we have some questions about what kind of plants were being used to make. Oh, okay. So plants are the, are a tricky question. So um, I'm absolutely certain that people were using lots of different dyes. We know we have tie dye textiles. Um, and when you look at, uh, records historically there are lots of examples of paint recipes where the paint is made by using a dye to stain a clay or talc kind of base. Um, so we know that people were using dyes. The problem is that dyes tend to be fugitive so they don't last long. So with a few rare exceptions most dyed items, even if they survive, so dyed textiles, for example, most of them, the colors have faded really, really badly. So it's difficult to study them unless you're doing um, really specific chemical testing to figure out exactly what's there. So yes, people were using lots of different plants for dyes. We don't have many details, although we can take some good guesses based on um, historic and contemporary uh, dyers and what they use. Okay, this is a very important question. Where can I get your book? <laughs> oh, um, <laughs> um, well, it's uh, published by the University of Utah Press, so you could get it from the press website directly. If you had a local bookstore, I would love it if you would ask them if they could order it because pandemics and local businesses could probably really use your support, or it'd be easy to find online as well. Okay. Um, Somebody's asking about the kinds of tools that were used to to support the display and use of colors. I, I think they're thinking about paint brushes and ways to apply. Yeah, yeah. Um, I didn't don't have any photos um, in this particular talk of tools. I was trying not to overdo it because this is one of my favorite aspects of paint is kind of the technology of it. Um, so there are lots of different tools that people used. Um, Making and, and applying paint requires doing things like grinding or processing the pigment. So there's lots of different kinds of ground stone that might be used. Um, sometimes manos and matates, which we normally think of as being used to grind corn or other kind of grains. Um, sometimes smaller grinding stones that are used to grind pigment. There are often bowls or jars that are used to uh, reconstitute pigment or mix it with different 
with water and binders and whatnot. So like the paint pots that you see on the screen right now. Um, and then in terms of brushes, there aren't a lot of examples, but we do have some examples of um, brushes made out of yucca. So yucca fiber, it's a very strong, long fiber um, that works well as a brush. Um, some examples of twigs that where the end of the twig was dipped into paint and used as a brush. And then also people use their fingers and hands as brushes and sometimes would um, chew pigment and then generate a lot of saliva and spit the pigment onto a surface and do a kind of a spraying technique, um, which gives a really neat effect, but also can actually be quite dangerous for the person doing it because if you do that with a paint that contains a lot of copper, like some of the green paints, um, ingesting too much copper can actually make you quite sick. Um, and so it's not necessarily um, a safe thing to do, but people definitely chewed and spit um, pigments in order to spray them or blow them over a broader area. And yeah, that was one of the most interesting things about your book, I think, is actually the tools that people used in a variety of them. Um, Let's see, we do have some questions about sort of the symbolism and meaning of color. Um, somebody asked about cardinal directions. Is there, are there colors that are associated with particular cardinal directions? I think you mentioned that real quickly, but I'll let you talk about it some yeah, more. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I'm just gonna go to, go to this photo just because I love this mural and it's such a great, um, such a great modern uh, Hopi work. Um, by two artists um, from 2001. It's at the Museum of Northern Arizona. Um, so when we look uh, ethnographically and into the historic literature, we know that all of the Pueblos um, have symbolism associated with the four directions as well as above and below. I'm actually opening my book here because this is the kind of information that I always need to look up rather than remembering. And the reason why is because um, when you look across the different Pueblos and different Pueblo language groups, there are some regularities or consistencies in color symbolism related to direction, and then there's some variation as well. So all uh, Pueblo groups associate red with south and white with east. Sometimes that's directly south, directly east. Sometimes it's intercardinal directions. But then when you look in other directions, there's a bit more variability. So um, north and west tend to be yellow and blue, but in um, a few cases that's reversed. And then when you look at above and below, the colors are much more varied. And so they vary from language group to language group. So it's consistent that colors are strongly associated with different directions, but the specific associations vary from place to place which makes it hard to know what to say about the past. <laughs> yes, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. Um, somebody asked about the theory um, that black and white on pottery might symbolize colors. Mm, what, yeah, what okay. that? yeah, yeah. So um, uh, Steve Plogg uh, wrote about this um, a while back, it might have been 2003, I think. Um, and he was following up on a suggestion from the art historian J.J. Brody, who said, you know, there's this, a lot of pottery has, um, I'm trying to think if I have any good examples of it in my slides, and I might not. Um, a lot of black and white pottery has areas that have very distinctive black and um, Oh, shoot, I didn't quite, I'm just looking for this on my screen here. Sorry, just one second. Yep. Um, not what I'm trying to do. So that a lot of uh, black and white pottery has areas that definitely appear to be black and other areas where the, the black is much fi more finely done. And so the question is, could that reflect some other sort of color? And if you see on the screen here, the um, picture on the right hand side, the right hand photo is black on white, but within the black section, it's got this dot in square design. This is a design that we saw uh, 
in the Pueblo IV period in tie-dyed textiles shown in um, Kiva murals. So this is from the Pueblo II period from Chaco Canyon. And um, Jerry Brody suggested maybe these kind of in-between fine line black work, maybe this represents turquoise. Because one of the problems with, um, not problems, one of the challenges with putting color onto pottery is that when you fire colors, they not only can change in the firing, but certain colors disappear. So you can't, using the technology available to Pueblo people at the time, you can't fire ceramics and fire blue as a color on them. If you wanted blue, you would have to add it as paint on the surface later, which would be liable to rub off. So anyway, so um, Jerry Brody thought maybe some of these kind of finer line um, black and white designs might represent turquoise. And Steve Fogg took a look at it. And I think it seems uh, pretty plausible. I mean, you look at the two items in the in the, the right hand photo here, you look at that black painted white slipped pitcher and then this turquoise encrusted basket next to it. And those little squares, the dot and square design on that picture look an awful lot like the turquoise pieces in the mosaic in terms of scale and the way that they're organized, as well as referencing, I think, some of these uh, black and white tie dyed textiles. So it seems plausible to me that um, that using a kind of in between fine lined hatching or in this case, this dot and square, it could it could be essentially representing blue, which is really impossible to get um, unless you're going to paint directly on the ceramic after it's fired. Right. Okay, we're sort of jumping all over the place, but here's a question about buildings. Were okay. the outside wall were the outside walls of buildings colored, and are there differences in those colors for different kinds of buildings? Mm. That's um. Uh, in some cases, they were. Um, there are sites up in um, southeast Utah that are built in underneath overhanging rock faces. So they're not in caves exactly, but they're in overhanging areas where the overhang has protected the walls of the building from the weather. Um, and there are some very well-known sites up in the Cedar Mesa area, for example, um, that have painting on the outside of buildings. Um, in terms of whether or not there's much difference, I don't think we know enough to say for sure. And that is because the number of buildings that were built under shelter in that way, where any paint that was on the outside is still preserved, is really, really small. So we just know a handful of cases. And in those cases that I'm aware of, they're mostly white or red. Um, and that's actually quite similar to other sites in that same area at that same time period. So I don't, I don't know that they're using color to necessarily try to distinguish different kinds of buildings. Um, there are authors, Polly Shasma has argued, for example, that um, certain rock art images that are on cliff faces above buildings are used to communicate with people from a long distance away. So there's some places where, for example, there's enormous round images of white shields that are painted on cliff faces above buildings. And that seems very strongly to communicate with people approaching the site, presumably to say something about who's who lives there or how the site is protected. Okay, well, it is about 510, so I think maybe we will cut it off here. Okay. Uh, Merritt, thank you so much for this, and all of, you know, there were a lot more questions, and for all of you who still have questions, I suggest reading the book. <laughs> um, so thank you again, Merritt, and uh, thank you to all the people who watched, and uh, thank you to all of you who reminded us that we had the dates wrong for the talks next week and the week after. They are in October, October 8th and 15th. Hopefully people will attend some of those uh, and we'll wrap up. Thanks everybody. Thank you. All right. All right.